so much. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. And it's really inspiring to see uh, all of you here thinking about how we use all this technology and disruption in the social interest. And I think that's very much the theme, going to be the theme of, uh, uh, of my talk as well. Um, so this is a great opportunity for me just to share uh, some of our interests in technology, disruption, big data, AI. Uh, what are some of the things we think through from the regulatory perspective uh, you know, as all of this advances and we move forward societally? Um, so for us, I think the step back is, you know, it all starts with what we're trying to achieve as the regulator, uh, and that comes down to our, 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 our legal remit and our mission. So we regulate a huge space. We are um, the regulator for, for most UK financial markets. So this spans retail uh, markets, wholesale markets. Uh, on the retail side, you know, it ranges from some of the high street, uh, the high street banks that many of you will be familiar with, through to sole trader, uh, financial advisors, peer-to-peer uh, -peer lenders, so a really wide gamut of, uh, of uh, operators and providers. And then on the wholesale side, sort of equally vast, really, investment banking through to fund management and securities trading. So it's, it's really quite a wide remit. Uh, we've got, you know, ticking up towards 60,000 uh, entities in this, in this scope uh, that we need to regulate. So, but what are we really, so that's fine, but what are we really trying to achieve? So this is where, if you like, uh, you know, some of the considerations from the economics and other disciplines starts to kick in as well. So what's our mission? So we're here to ensure that the markets work well for consumers, okay? So that's quite a high level uh, strategic objective for us. What does it really mean? Well, unpacking it at the next level, um, it's about protecting consumers, promoting effective competition in their interest, but also about safeguarding the integrity and resilience of the UK financial system overall, where we obviously are very closely uh, collaborating with, with various partners domestically and internationally. Um, so it's really quite a, a complex, challenging agenda. And if you like, it's becoming uh, more complex, more interesting and more challenging with the rise of, uh, of technology, big data, uh, techniques like uh, AI. We're seeing um, disruption or potential disruption across the value chain in financial services, okay, right uh, from uh, upfront consumer decision support, marketing, pricing, through uh, internal operations, um, fraud detection, how you comply with regulations. So really um, sort of a wide base for, for actual or potential disruption. Um, and various figures on this. We, did, we teamed up with the Bank of England recently, did a little bit of our own uh, research uh, just to get a sense for some of the developments in the marketplace around machine learning. So we surveyed some firms there. It wasn't exhaustive, not necessarily completely representative of, of the market overall, but we did see some uh, confirmation there that uh, adoption of machine learning, experimentation with machine learning is on the rise, interest is on the rise. Um, this spans front office and back office applications, so really a range of business areas. Um, most, most common was an interest in uh, anti-money laundering, fraud detection, but also many customer-facing applications. And in many cases, the development was really, uh, you know, it, it had hit that development threshold and, and gone beyond. So back to our mission. So what does this all mean for us? Well, you know, I'm an economist by training. Um, uh, some of my colleagues, Chris and Mara here today, uh, you know, representing sort of behavioral science, competition, economics. Um, we need to be um, really understanding how these markets work in order to design effective regulation. That means evidence-based policy, okay? Uh, then at the, at the same point in time, for a given regulatory regime, we need to just operate as efficiently and effectively as we can as a regulator in the public interest, delivering public value. So technology is really increasingly at the heart of all of this, but also a number of disciplines start to kick in. So in terms of really understanding how markets are working, you can think of economics as a bit of an organizing discipline, but also psychology, linguistics, um, ethics, the law, many other disciplines are important too. So this is very much an interdisciplinary agenda. We need to combine these in, uh, disciplines, integrate them um, to be as effective as we can. So let's think about industry's use of um, technology, the disruption that we're seeing there, and some of the considerations or use cases, if you like, that ar arise for us. Um, think about retail markets first. So I think a step back point here is that if you think about a technology, a set of technologies like AI, it's really about powerful prediction, okay? So as individuals, we're becoming easier to predict uh, in many aspects of our lives. And um, 
in some sense, this is a really fantastic thing. Okay, I think we all, all can benefit hugely from this, and we do benefit hugely from it. So when you're more predictable, um, firms can meet your needs more effectively. They can get ahead of those and anticipate uh, what's really going to deliver value for you. And this can reduce search frictions, give you your time back, um, improve your quality of life and your outcomes in life. At the same time, of course, when you're more predictable, um, you're um, potentially exploitable. Um, and this may be a particular concern for the vulnerable. So think about, you know, I'm interested in what you might call social data science, and my colleagues are as well. Um, and in many ways, that's, that's the work that we're doing. So integrating economics, behavioral science, data science, thinking about predicting, thinking about potentially interventions to, to support um, behavior in a person's own interest. Of course, that could all be used against you in, the, in a wider marketplace as well. And that could be deliberate or it could be inadvertent. So those are some of the cons broader considerations. But let's zero in on, on one or two examples just briefly. So credit scoring. This is an important prediction problem for all of us. It affects all of our lives. Um, you know, what is your credit worthiness and how can you make sure that you have a good, accurate sense for that in the hands of uh, providers of credit? So what are some of the considerations? Well, you know, let's just think about what's happening here. Traditionally, uh, in credit scoring, a provider would take a conventional econometric approach, right? So maybe build a logistic regression, quite a structured approach, and feed that with quite limited amounts of structured data. So typically, uh, payments and, and transaction histories, OK? And that would give a certain predictive accuracy for that problem. Um, these days, um, firms are getting interested in the use of machine learning in that context as well, and that's very understandable because it may deliver a predictive edge, okay? Machine learning can also handle a broader range of inputs. So it might be, you know, that you're, we, talk, we heard all earlier um, about the use of rental payments, but it could also be uh, data sources like social media, text-based analysis, phone records, all kinds of things in principle. So from the regulatory perspective, we need to understand what this does to the markets, what, what are the implications for consumers, and then are there any risks to consider? So in terms of the potential gains uh, here, you know, obviously it's about potentially more nuanced, more accurate credit uh, assessments for individuals. This could be really beneficial. It could be particularly beneficial if you are lacking the conventional history in a market. You're a thin file, in which case you may get access to credit here when otherwise, in the counterfactual, you'd be denied credit or, or simply not able to be scored. So from a welfare point of view, that's a very important consideration, potentially very positive. But there are some considerations on the risk side as well. So when you shift from a traditional statistical technology um, to a machine learning based approach, you might lose some transparency and explainability. You may be able to add it back. That's a live agenda for research. There may be concerns about the fairness of the algorithm that start to kick in. Uh, there's an academic literature, um, we're part of that literature in some of our own work, looking at um, the extent to which uh, but some bias might arise through triangulation of protected characteristics in large scale historic data sets when you switch to machine learning. There may be some trade offs to consider between that and accuracy, all relevant from a welfare point of view. There may be obviously many, many other concerns like data privacy and security when you're talking about some of these alternative data sets, particularly. Um, I want to talk to you about robo-advice. So my, my colleagues and I are very passionate about thinking about decision support. And why is that? Well, in this context of financial decision making, um, many of us face decisions that we find really quite tough. Why is that? Well, because often we're taking decisions in a complex environment, making decisions uh, where the ramifications may only land um, you know, well into the future, so under quite a lot of uncertainty. Um, and we all have our cognitive biases and limitations, okay? So financial literacy can, can from, for all of us, really, at, at one point or another, can be a real challenge. Think about making a big pensions decision or choosing to switch mortgages, which mathematically is a real options problem. So this is a tough environment for, for a consumer and for decision making. It's not, I worked for a while on health system uh, design over in the US, and when you think about health care decision making, there are many parallels actually that, that interest me and I think there too decision support could be valuable. Now you could go to a human uh, professional advisor, so some of us do, it can be quite costly for individuals, many individuals choose not to do that um, and, and find the costs I think prohibitive. Um, think about the use of technology in this context and you could potentially get very excited, okay? So 
uh, could be lower cost advice, available around the clock. It may be more tailored to you as an individual, more suitable for you, more consistent because you haven't got heterogeneous uh, human agents out there providing advice. You've now got, got the algorithm. Um, and of course, there'll be this audit trail, everything's digital, there'll be this audit trail and this opportunity for mon monitoring, which may give us um, assurances. But there are some challenges as well. So think about the supply side and the demand side of this. On the supply side, uh, you're training algorithms here to give advice. How good is the suitability of the advice? Uh, will it cater really to the, the, the mean of a distribution or the average, and less so to the niche profiles in the tails? That's a concern. Um, will it really be able to handle vulnerabilities or identify the vulnerable and really make sure that their interests are safeguarded? Uh, will there be concerns here about algorithmic bias, the black box nature of models? And then a step back point again is that whenever you switch from this sort of pool of heterogeneous agents to a single approach embedded in an algorithm, you may actually begin to create some systemic risks. So if there's mis-selling here, it goes live at once across uh, a swathe of the market. So there are some uh, potential additional considerations. On the demand side, it's not a complete given that uh, you, know, you guys, that all of us are going to adopt this stuff, right? So what's important there? Well, actually, trust is really important. Um, and there's an interesting literature uh, being led out of the US at the moment, and we've got a foot in that literature as well in some of our work, looking at trust in algorithms, our relationship with algorithms. Uh, many of us uh, appear under some circumstances to be somewhat algorithmic, uh, algorithm averse. Uh, at other times, we may appreciate algorithms and actually the bias may run the other way. That's interesting to unpack and could be not just interesting academically, it could be important when we think about how this market develops and how we really get engagement. Wholesale and securities uh, markets, many considerations as well. So um, we're seeing algorithmic trading on quite a widespread scale. Many of you may be familiar with uh, you know, the, the fact that we've got quite a lot of high frequency trading going on in our professional financial markets. Um, it's not all AI or machine learning based, but we are seeing applications and interest in optimizing execution using algorithms, trading volatility, even picking stocks in some cases. And there too, we see some considerations, you know, both on the, uh, you know, the potentially very positive side as well as some, some uh, concerns to keep in mind. On the positive side, there are potential efficiency gains. So there's some academic research which has looked at high frequency trading. It certainly drives down the cost of trading. What does it do to the informational efficiency of the market, the efficiency of those prices? There's evidence that it tightens the bid-ask spreads and improves the accuracy of, of the price. And that's good from a welfare point of view. It means resources in these markets get allocated more efficiently, if that's true. Um, on the, on the side of some concerns, I think there are you know, ongoing considerations related to uh, excess volatility. Some of you may have heard of flash crashes. We have a small program of research looking at the dynamics of flash crashes, just sort of unpicking the trading around those and trying to understand what's really happening. Um, but high frequency trading is in, in the picture there. Um, there are some potential stability risks. Um, if you have lots of agents in the markets now trading with potentially common algorithms, then you may get a herding approach uh, from a sort of alien looking down perspective. And this can start to have systemic uh, uh, considerations, I think. Now, I want to talk a little bit about ways of working. And I had a, a good chat with Lauren on the phone, uh, I think just on Friday, about some of this. So. Think about firms that are out there exploiting existing approaches to serving consumers versus those that are really in more of an explorative um, phase. So they're actually uncovering new ways of working, potentially very different, radically different business models. What does it mean for us as a regulator? Well, we probably need to innovate how we're working to engage differently with, with these different types of firms. And so we've, that's something we've, we've been working on at the FCA. Um, and you know we've been... Uh, we, we have a, a Project Innovate program, which is really trained on trying to support fintech in the social interest. So we engage heavily with fintech, both here domestically as well as internationally. We pioneered here in the UK uh, a sandbox approach where we provide innovative uh, players with an opportunity to come into a live environment and sort of test out a proposition at the same time as making sure certain safeguards are in place for, for consumers and that there's enough scrutiny and support from the regulatory side uh, that this model can be refined and tweaked and ultimately we can all be comfortable that this is a good model that's going to work in the social interest. And that's a really different way of working for us and we've been running that for a few years and now and had many firms uh, come through our sandbox. 
I want to just finish by talking about uh, the, the, the other piece of this, which is, do you know what? There's just this huge opportunity here for us as regulators and policymakers to work differently internally. Um, we have vast troves of data. We can harness the same uh, statistical tools and techniques, the te techniques from machine learning, AI, natural language processing, network analysis, to be more efficient and effective through our own operations. Okay, so let's talk about just high level, a couple of examples here. So we face a lot of prediction problems, okay? And AI is a prediction technology, so this is great. Um, you know, we want to identify, predict market abuse, potentially collusion. Um, we would like to identify and support the vulnerable more effectively. Um, so think about vulnerability. How can we use all of this stuff in the social interest for more vulnerable members of society by um, figuring out who's really at risk, potentially of problem debt, um, thinking then about behavioral science, how would you design uh, nudges to support these people differently and maybe help them uh, avoid tipping into persistent debt, okay? We could think about understanding nuances around consumers. So maybe, you know, cons we know consumers are not all of one type, but sometimes it can be hard to not to just design policy for the average and to really cater for, for the full richness of, of the distribution. And so we could think about having uh, a better understanding of the distributional impact of our policies, maybe even one day having personalized policy, okay, which would be a real step change in, the, in, in uh, policy making. And then finally, just to end, there's a huge opportunity around um, people science, people analytics internally for us as a regulator. How do we create the right environment for us to be successful and productive in the social interest internally? How do we harness technology at the regulatory interface, interface to make sure that that's as efficient and effective as possible for us and for firms um, and make sure the markets are working well? So there's this huge agenda around something called RegTech. It really would be a conference in its own right and often is. Um, but this is very exciting. Uh, at the bleeding edge of that, we're working on things like machine executable regulations, okay? Um, so let me just uh, conclude by um, telling you, again, that I think technology, big data, AI, the kind of disruption we're all talking about, it's exciting. It brings new considerations for us as a regulator and challenges us to think about, uh, you know, hard about how we're working and be as effective as we can in this, in this shifting context. It may shift the economics of markets in some cases and raise some new ethical considerations for us to work through. Um, the stakes are very high because innovation is critical to the social interest. Um, consumers can benefit enormously if we get this right. At the same time, clearly, whenever you uh, get into an explorative mode and um, reinvent processes and ways of engaging, there are some risks that can arise, so we have to identify them and manage them safely. And then finally, there are these huge opportunities for us as a regulator to, to innovate ourselves. We can have new ways of working, things like our sandbox, um, engage differently, but also internally, we have vast amounts of often unique data. We can use all of the same scientific approaches to really understand at a deep level how the markets are functioning and make sure that the policy that we develop is truly evidence-based and that we're operating as efficiently as we can around that. So thanks very much for listening. I'll be happy to pick up a few questions over, over coffee. There may be one now from you, I think. Thank you. Can you give a round of applause?